In my talk this morning, I'm going to encourage you to ask questions along the way. This is a discussion about foreign aid, not only what it is, but I want to talk about the nature of aid, sometimes misunderstood. There's a debate about whether aid can be good or bad for a country. And we want to also then move on to look at sort of new actors in this foreign aid space, which includes the BRICS and other emerging markets. And finally, we want to look at some new approaches to aid and what the sustainable development goals mean in terms of providing the types of foreign aid that are provided. So let's begin just simply, what is foreign aid? We all know about humanitarian assistance. This is emergency aid. There's really no debate about this. Most people think this is something good. When a country has some type of crisis or catastrophe, humanitarian assistance is a good thing for our partners to provide. Military aid, on the other hand, many countries are supplying cheap military equipment or subsidized military equipment. Again, in this case, this is the opposite end where we generally frown on this. We don't really like to consider this as something positive or sort of aid. This is just politics. Countries that give money, when a country makes a donation to the United Nations or to the World Bank or pays its dues to the IMF, it can count that as a form of aid because those organizations are passing on some benefits. It's a relatively small proportion of aid, but this multilateral aid is another small element. The big element is development assistance. This is the foreign aid to help development of a country, and this is where the main debate lies. So what makes it foreign aid as opposed to commercial loans or commercial venture is that that development assistance can be one of two forms. It can be a grant where the money is given outright as a gift, or it can be a subsidized loan. So grant is clearly aid. Subsidized loans, or sometimes what we call a concessional loan, is also counted as aid because you're giving somebody a loan at below market rates. Usually it means a very cheap interest rate, a long time to repay, and that gets counted as foreign aid. And we'll come back to the question of how you measure that because at what point does it move from being a commercial loan to a subsidized loan? And that's not such a clear question. And aid can go, oh, technical assistance is also aid because the donor is sending, instead of money, is paying for a consulting service to the receiving country. So that's also another form of aid. But amongst this sort of development assistance, we often, again, so you're familiar with some of the lingo, there's project aid. The money goes towards a specific project. It might be building a road, a school, an electricity generating plant, or it could be something we call general budget support. They give money to the government, no strings attached, and the government can use it to cover its fiscal deficit or spend it as it wishes. So that's the general outline. And the question, you know, how is this aid supposed to work? What is the logic? Well, the traditional logic is if you're a low-income country, you have a lack of savings. If you're a high-income country, you probably have more of a surplus of savings. So low-income countries need to invest. They don't have a lot of savings. High-income countries have excess savings. They loan it to low-income countries even at a cheap rate, and they're helping to create more investment in a country, help to raise the potential GDP. Now, 
In recent years, the rich countries of the OECD have aimed this aid more and more towards pro-poor type of aid, helping the poorest people in the country. And trying to help governments stabilize. So the aid has even gone, there's, you know, this aid could go in two ways, or these cheap loans. Could go to help build infrastructure, which the World Bank tends to do, or it can go towards, let's say, pro-poor expenditure, trying to help the poorest people in the country. And of course, foreign aid serves two purposes in that one, it gives the government of the receiving country money, and it also brings foreign currency into the country, so it solves a balance of payments problem at the same time. But now, why do, uh, why do donors give aid? And that's, uh, you know, without being overly cynical, we can say no one is totally altruistic, so there's a lot of reasons why donors might be giving some aid. In the old days, when aid first started, there used to be something called tide aid. You'd give somebody a loan or a gift, and they would be obliged to spend that money in your home country. So you were actually increasing your domestic business by giving aid to a third party. That's what we call tie aid. So it's linked back to your own private sector. This is from time nowadays. It's uh, rather self-serving. Uh, aid is also, we have to face it, another form of politics. You give countries aid, you expect a favorable response. Maybe it's in the UN, maybe it's someplace else. So it's not unlinked from uh, political issues. We do see a lot of co European colonial powers give particularly aid to their ex-colonies. I don't know if you want to call this guilt money or uh, care and some history. But I prefer to, uh, and, and along with this, let's say, colonial history, countries often give aid to other countries of a similar culture. So Brazil, for example, is active with other uh, Portuguese-speaking countries in, in Africa, like Angola and Mozambique. Turkey has a lot of Turkish-speaking uh, countries in the, in the stands. So people often give aid to support um, ethnic groups or cultural problems to other countries. I like to think that aid is something we might call enlightened self-interest. And the logic of this is, is very straightforward. If you're my neighbor and you're better off, I'm better off. If you're poor and destitute, it doesn't help me at all. In fact, if my neighbor is poor and destitute, it's likely to cause problems for me, refugee problems, other types of activities that will not be beneficial to me as a country. Uh, however, if you're prosperous, that's going to create more business ties, that's going to improve my life as well. So, uh, there is some type of, there should be some type of mutual benefit associated with, uh, with foreign aid. Let me come back to what this uh, official development assistance is. This is a definition of what it is because countries like to measure how much aid they give. So we have to be a bit careful about what fits the definition of aid and what isn't in the definition. So not only is it, well, official means from a government to another government usually, and it has to be related to this development and welfare of the developing country. And as I mentioned before, this idea that it has to be concessional or cheaper than market or subsidized. Now, let's take a look at this concessional because uh, you'll see these things get more and more complicated as you dig into them. Up until 2017, the idea was that the value of that aid 
had to be, have a grand element, or the way we measured that grand element, how cheap it was, we took the face value of a loan, which might be a million dollars, and then we calculated the present value of the loan. So the present value of the loan is you take all the future repayment flows of principal and interest, and you discount them. Now, if you discount them at the same rate of interest as the loan, the present value is equal to the face value. But if you discount them at a higher rate of interest, or in other words, if you use the market rate of interest to discount them, but the actual interest payments are at a rate below the market, then we can have a situation where the present value of the loan is less than the face value, and the country is getting a grant element. And this grant element had to be at least 25% of the value of the loan had to be equivalent of a grant, and that was considered foreign aid. This left out one very big problem, and that was about the exchange rate. And I'm going to show you a little example here. I did an example. Let's look here. A country borrows, this came out of a project, by the way, I did for the South African government. They were borrowing money in euros and dollars. Let's say you borrow money in dollars at 4%. That's not a subsidized rate, that's the market rate. In the U.S., because long-term money is very cheap. And typically you get a loan for development purposes of 20 or 30 years. Sometimes they give you a few years of a grace period. You don't have to pay it back immediately. And the OECD set the discount rate at 10%, fixed. That was the discount rate. Now, because you can see that the interest rate is 4%, the discount rate is 10%, when you do this calculation for the net present value, you find out the face value is like 37%, sorry, the present value is 37% less than the face value. So it looks like this loan has a big subsidy, and it does, in dollars. Now, South Africa, South African government, does it in dollars. Actually, when it pays back a loan, it has to go out and tax, because the government is paying back the loan, they're earning rent. And then they have to go out and buy the dollars to pay back the loan. Now, we know that, typical of a lot of developing or middle-income countries, the rand is not such a strong currency, and on average, it tends to depreciate over time. You know, and you can use as a rule of thumb that a currency will depreciate by how much more inflation it has than the partner country. So, we know in South Africa, inflation is 5 or 6%. In the U.S., inflation was just 1 or 2%. So, there can be a 4 or 5% general depreciation occurring on average. Now, the South African government has been conservative and also wise. They're worried about taking large amounts of dollar-based or euro-based loans because if something happens to their currency, they could be exposed to a big foreign exchange crisis. If you have a lot of debt, all denominated in dollars, and your currency crashes, now you have a very big, a much bigger problem. So they tend, they do something called a swap. You can go to a bank, well, some of the big international banks, and they will convert your dollar loan into a rand loan for you. But of course, you're no longer paying, you pay a, a charge for the conversion, but you no longer just pay interest at 4%. Basically, when you convert into a rand loan, you're now paying the South African rate of interest for long-term money, which is uh, 9%. So, you, so South African treasury bills, 10-year treasury bills, are running around 9%. Now if we do the same calculation and we see what the swapped loan looks like, 
that one million dollars becomes 14 million rand. The interest rate that the government pay, is paying is 9%. It still has these other characteristics. If we keep the same discount rate at 10%, then the grant element now goes down to 6%. It doesn't look like such a great deal, like you're getting a lot of aid. So this is a, a big issue that we spent a lot of time with the South African government telling them, you're not getting such a good deal. You don't have to, the donors are saying, the donor banks or the donor aid agencies would come and say, ah, we're going to give you subsidized money. Look, 4% interest. But it's 4% of the dollars, it's not 4% of the rand. So, there's a, uh, the donors like to, uh, let's say, emphasize that they're giving uh, aid because they're, the countries get sort of credit. They try to perform well. There's some targets for countries trying to give out as much aid as possible. But my point here is it depends how you want to measure this, that it's not such a simple uh, element that at the end of the day. So then, in, uh, in 2018, some of the rules for how to measure concessional elements changed to be, let's say, more favorable for developing countries. So now, if you're a less developed country, a low-income country, the grant element has to be 45%. And you can you use a discount rate of 9%. So it's harder to get to the 45%. It's harder to get to the criteria, and 45% requires a higher grant element. Lower middle income countries, the discount rate is 7%. This is for developed donors. So donors are giving their loans in euros, dollars, and yen. They use a lower discount rate, and for upper middle income countries, an even lower discount rate. Uh, and the criteria for being, for being a grant is, is less. So they've now taken account of the fact many developing countries can go out and borrow on their own. Places like Brazil, well, most of the BRICS countries could go out and borrow pretty close to what they would get as even subsidized loans from, uh, from, the, uh, from the World Bank. Uh, so the aid element now is much more important for less developed countries, and it's required that they have a higher, a higher uh, grant element. So who are these, who are the, uh, Low income, middle income. Every year or two years, the World Bank revises its definition of the thresholds. These would be in nominal dollars. And you can see this is a current definition for 2018. A low income country, your per capita income is under $1,000. Middle income can go anything from $1,000 to 12,200. High income countries begin at 12,200 dollars per person. And this is your gross national income per capita. It's close to the gross domestic product per capita. There's a couple of slight differences, but for the most part, whether it's gross national income or gross domestic product, we can think of it as the same. The big point is that a lot of times we talk about a middle income trap. This middle income is a, is a big distance, very hard. Many countries migrate from low income to middle income, but it's tough to get out of middle income. And the BRICS countries all fall in this category of upper middle income countries. Uh, I found some figures. for uh, this movement of countries. Uh, unfortunately, somehow we had a lot more countries in uh, 2000, 
2018 and 2005. But there has been some migration from low income to middle income, and even from middle income to high income. But uh, these figures mis uh, are a little bit misleading because new countries get added in. These aren't always full countries, they're territories and areas and uh, the territories as well. But we often talk about middle income track because it's very hard to get out of a middle income country uh, regime. Now, we said the donor countries have a policy of trying to give a certain amount of money to foreign aid. Uh, the definition or the, the threshold has been set at 0.7% of GDP or GNI, gross national income. That's the target for these, uh, the, the DAC countries are the development assistance countries. They're largely the OECD. But now the question is, are, is there more aid being given or less aid? And it's a little tricky to measure because if we look here as the share of income that countries give, going back to 1960, it actually declined for quite some period of time, up until around 2000, as a share of their income. And then it started going back up. And you can see it's just about 0.3% of, of the gross national income of developed countries in total. But if we look at the amount of aid that's been flowing, to from all these OECD countries to developing countries. It's been pretty much going up, except for we had some period in the 90s, but it's been going up. So, you want to ask not just about the amount of money going, but the amount of effort you put in, and that's what we really look at as a share of um, of, uh, of GDP. Uh, another aspect to see who's getting this money, and you can't, I don't know how I'll explain, I'm not sure how clearly it is. Here we have the lower middle income countries in blue, and they've been shrinking a bit in terms of their share of the total aid. The upper middle income countries have also been shrinking, but the low income, the very lowest, in a category called fragile states, countries which have had maybe some social unrest, some war, or post-war countries, these are recognized for getting or identified in order to get more money. So the main donors are trying to focus money or into the poorest and the most problematic countries, which sounds uh, which sounds logical. Like if we look geographically, we can see Sub-Saharan Africa is the biggest receiver of foreign aid of all this ODA, Overseas Development Aid, that occurs. Uh, that represents fluctuates with something close to or near 3% of the GDP of the sub-Saharan African economies. 3% of GDP is a big number. I mean, this is, so it, it's a very significant impact on these, on these countries. And if we want to look at the sectoral distribution of where this aid is going, well, this is for the total aid. 13% was humanitarian aid. Uh, the rest is 66% is, uh, is this development assistance that we talked about. And in that development assistance, this is so called this is social infrastructure, 34%. Education, health, water and sanitation, various sorts of social infrastructure as opposed to economic infrastructure, which had 17% of the aid, transport, communication, energy, 
and other types of uh, business services. And we, we want to think about who are the big donors. Well, again, there's this measurement issue. The U.S. is the biggest donor in terms of dollars. But in pure dollars, the U.S. is donating some $30 billion a year. But as a share of its GDP, it's down here at about 0.2%. Of, G, of its GDP, whereas Sweden, Norway, Luxembourg, Denmark, Netherlands, UK have typically been the uh, given the most in terms of effort as a share of their GDP, and they've surpassed the 0.7 uh, percent goal that was set by the uh, OECD. So the problem is, everybody, you know, it's nice, well, it makes sense to give your money to the poorest countries, but, in fact, a large portion of poverty, of global poverty, still remains in the middle-income countries. And just this estimate from the World Bank, I typifies that middle-income countries are estimated at 73% of the world's poor and about 33% of, of global GDP. So that, me and everyone here who's come from, well, Brazilians know, uh, Brazil is very similar to South Africa in having this uh, high gene coefficient, a very uh, unfair, well, unfair, very, uh, dispersed distribution of income, so there's a lot of people living who are very well off, but still a lot of people in a relatively um, upper middle income country. So here's our question. Now, there's a debate that goes on in the literature whether aid is good or bad. People used to say, well, aid is good in the old days, but now we've had some important economists the least really, at least Moyo, who said, aid does more harm than it does good. It's a little bit like the argument for giving charity. Are you preventing somebody from being self-sufficient? Are you making them dependent on charity or dependent on aid? The other thing is that aid in many countries competes, is a competing source of revenue with uh, tax revenue because it's a source of income for the government. Now, when the government taxes the people, it is responsible to the people, or the, or the taxpayers hold the government responsible for what's happening. When the government gets most of its money from aid agencies, well, its loyalty or its response is going more to the aid agencies than it is to, the, to their taxpayers. So, Dennis yeah. Moyo, in fact, has been a big uh, critic of aid for some time. And some of her arguments are that it does, it's a temporary solution for an aid. It's not permanent. It's not sustainable. Uh, it can encourage corruption. It uh, does it hurt civil society. And it undermines the social capital. And I'd like to... See if I can. Thank you. 
In the case of, of very poor countries, that the project aid, they often get budget aid where the European government or the US government may give money directly to the budget with no strings attached so they can use it to just plug gaps or deficit financing. But what we've seen also is that many donors are uh, concerned about corruption in countries. They don't want to give money directly to the government, both out of fear of corruption, money being misallocated, or the high administrative costs of administering aid in a, in a uh, country. And now there's been a shift by some countries, notably the United States, that gives money directly to the service provider. So a typical example of this is the, uh, the US gives a lot of money to this uh, PEPFAR, which is an HIV uh, assistance or prevention program. They give a lot of money to in South Africa. But the money doesn't go to the South African government. They work with the South African government to identify where this money should be spent. And a lot of the money is spent on HIV education. It's spent on people going out to villages, delivering services to help people deliver the drugs and so forth. And the US government then pays the service delivery agent, which is often an NGO, or the individual people who are working for the government, pays them directly. So the money, because it's a, it's done under a, uh, a bilateral agreement, it's still considered like the money is going to the government, but in fact, the money goes directly to the uh, service provider. So this is another difference in model. Thinking about how the sort of aid delivery works, today there's a concern about, because aid is like a scarce resource, you want to get the most benefit out of it. So you hear donors talk about things like blending and leveraging. Well, what does that leveraging mean? It means that instead of, a lot of times you want to support small and medium enterprises in a country. So many times an aid donor will set up a fund to give loans to small and medium-sized uh, small and medium-sized enterprises. Well, if you put a million dollars in that fund, you can only you can loan out a million dollars. But if you take that million dollars and you go to a commercial bank and you say, "I'll pay the interest rate for the loans that you make to small and medium-sized enterprises." and let the commercial bank make the loans and you pay the interest, boy, now that million dollars goes a lot further. Or if you go to the commercial bank and say, I'm gonna give guarantees for the loans that you make because we know maybe 20 or 30% of these small and medium enterprise loans might fail. I'm gonna give you the million dollars, put it into a guarantee fund, and we want you to make the loans and we're going to guarantee them so you don't have to take any losses. So you can see there's a lot of effort now going into this idea of leveraging that aid or creating matching grants. Sometimes donors will create money and then ask for the government to do matching grants. But this is all about this idea of leveraging and uh, it's often called blending where you're doing some commercial type of activity together with some cheap uh, uh, grant money. Uh, and it, well, these are various other types of things, but I try to give you the idea. <clears throat> I want to look now at uh, all this that I talked about, about aid, has been really this traditional aid donors uh, from OECD countries, high income countries. And now there's new donors coming out of the city. So these are the 28 development assistance corporate uh, development assistance uh, coordination countries, the, the OECD countries. They gave 84 percent of the money roughly in the past few years, and now there's 
an additional 20 countries who have started to give aid, like Brazil, China, South Africa, India. They're upper middle income countries. They're giving some small, some amounts of aid, which now we're accounting for well, maybe around 15% of total of total aid. Who they are? Oh, these middle income countries. You know, this is a big problem in the middle income countries. The question is, how can you give aid when you have so many problems as well in your own in your own economy? And uh, this is a question you know I'll pose that we can come back to. Uh, but here's an example of some of these non dat non OECD countries. Well, okay, we've got the Middle East rich oil producers. They have big surpluses, but Argentina, Indonesia, Mexico, and Turkey, and the BRICS. So these tend to be the countries that are giving um, upper middle income countries that are providing that are providing aid, besides the rich countries. And I listed here some of the uh, aid agencies in those countries. Uh, that are responsible for managing the aid portfolio uh, in, in their respective countries. And the, the, the BRICS countries, for example, typical of a lot of the other emerging market countries, have started to establish some principles about giving aid. And it's worthwhile to, to look at them because they're a little bit different. What they call Reciproc well, let's do reciprocity less. And the aid has to be, well, demand-driven means what people in the receiving country need or want. It tends to mean that they're going to give aid for economic infrastructure, not for poverty so much. It tends to be driven, you're giving aid for economic infrastructure. Not, no conditionality for emerging market country aid respect for national sovereignty. And reciprocity means there should be some sort of mutual benefit involved. And we'll talk about what that it means. It's not just a, it means that we come back to this idea of tied aid, that sometimes you give aid which benefits your own country's businesses, because they get to implement the projects. And another interesting characteristic of the uh, the new the new donors is that they don't like to be called aid donors; they're development partners. So they see things a little bit differently. We'll look at that more. So the first countries that are doing humanitarian assistance, refugee assistance, lots of educational scholarships, technical and scientific cooperation peacekeeping operations, and something that you'll start to hear about, triangular cooperation. So they work with a rich country in a low-income country. So oftentimes, the, the upper middle of the emerging markets really have a lot of expertise. I mean, here we all are sitting here. This is a room with high level of expertise, and um, that can be used to give technical assistance to countries, to low-income countries, but emerging markets still lack a lot of money, so sometimes they team up with a high-income country who picks up more of the bills to assist a low-income country. So trilateral cooperation means three sort of players involved. We should talk a little bit about the China model, because China aid is, is very important. And my, my colleagues here can correct me if I've got anything wrong. But um, so the Chinese aid tends to be focused on economic infrastructure. China will build you, you know, new buildings, I mean, roads. They do economic infrastructure. Frequently, it's Thai aid in the sense that. Um, 
There was an example in South Africa not so long ago. South, the Chinese agreed to build a new technical, it's a college, a technical college. They would come in, they bring their, their whole team of Chinese, Chinese workers, materials from China, everything gets loaded on a ship, comes to Africa, builds everything, and turns it over to the, to the government. Now, South Africans didn't like that, but this is a very common, this is very common, and it is, it is a mutual benefit in the sense that you're turning over a piece of, creating a piece of economic infrastructure for the receiving country, and you benefit your own country a little bit by developing some business, you get the Chinese contractors to come over and do that. So this is the tide model, which has been very characteristic. Um, and very often, Chinese aid, this thing could be a grant fully built by the Chinese, and it's also, it's often a uh, side benefit to accompany other types of business ventures or a mining project that might be going on. So, the Chinese, otherwise, things like the Belt and Road Initiative, which are more FDI, are more loan-based, and maybe some of those are subsidized loans, but a lot of those are commercial loans. A lot of the Belt and Road is FDI type of investment. This I'm talking about is pure, um, pure foreign aid. So here's the, the sort of a new lingo, let's say, of Western OECD company, countries talk about charity in this South-South cooperation. Uh, the discussion is about opportunities. Instead of sympathy, we have empathy, moral obligation, solidarity. So the, there's a different approach. Instead of reciprocity, the Western countries who said there's no reciprocity. You're supposed to give money uh, or foreign aid without expecting anything in return. In you know, the new South-South uh, development, it's more about mutual benefit. And of course, there's a learning by doing ele element and um, this idea that Aid is often integrated into the uh, into the whole um, investment process. So we'll come back to uh, this could be a topic of discussion about the pros and cons of this approach. Let's see some of the uh, some. I have a little bit of data here. <laughs> so. China is now becoming one of the uh, largest uh, aid donors. And uh, from this day, you can see it's gone up in importance dramatically. Let's see if I hit that and the other. Oh. This idea of tide aid, the idea of mutual benefit. Well, This is, this is an area where I want to get your opinion on this as well. Uh, clearly, there's benefits for both the giving party as well as the receiving party. And um, I think it's a, it, this is one of the issues there. The Westerners criticize China for this, but of course, low income countries welcome the idea of having um, the sort of aid economic infrastructure added at uh, economic, welcome Chinese aid. Okay, here's total Chinese aid, uh, the grants and the loans. Um, so this is getting to be a big number. There's grant element, there's grants, and then there's subsidized concessional loans. And you can see that in recent years, it's grown uh, quite dramatically. And as you mentioned, China is now one of the larger aid providers. The sectors for 
Chinese egg. Getting, by the way, very difficult to get the data for Chinese egg. It's not officially published. Uh, the way some of this, the, the way we collect the data is actually there's been some projects to scan newspaper articles, to scan public uh, announcements about aid, and for people to follow up and create a database about the uh, amount of Chinese aid delivered because it's not published by the Chinese, it's not officially published. Uh, but what becomes clear is that here's transportation and storage, energy, these are in the A goes to economic infrastructure. It helps, you know, the Belt and Road Initiative is uh, linked to this idea of recreating the old Silk Road, but it's transport networks back to, the, to China. So a lot of A projects, in fact, are complementary to that to help transport and storage uh, in order to support investment on the, uh, on the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, okay, maybe I did that one. Here's a comparison of um, indicators of of alternatives to A, we're looking at trade. This is with uh, Africa. FEI and, and aid and other types of and infrastructure uh, financing. China in recent years has become the largest trading partner with, uh, with Africa for just about all African countries. It surpassed uh, the United States. If you take all of Europe combined, then Europe is still larger, but it's but China has become a huge trading partner. Well, it's the largest trading country in the world now. Uh, the FDI stock, China is still lower down the line. In terms of new FDI investment, however, China is growing. This is the fact is putting in more FDI than traditional African uh, partners uh, on aid. It's the U.S. is still very prevalent, and uh, with this infrastructure financing, uh, China is also extremely important. So China is, is the biggest, is the most important partner country in Africa on, in general uh, when it comes to trade, aid, and, um, and investment. The, uh, now I found some uh, article which was sort of comparing this Chinese versus uh, American aid, and this just goes back to part of the story that I was mentioning before, where most U.S. aid that goes into, well, I'll use South Africa as an example, is on uh, health, because it's HIV related. And that's probably typical of a lot of European aid going into Africa. It's health and education based. Chinese aid is going to be economic infrastructure based. So there's two different um, strategies that are being, uh, where the aid is being carried in. Yeah. So let me now, uh, Talk about some of this, some new approaches for aid, for this whole idea. Since the launching of the Strategic Development Goals in 2016, the question immediately, and these are, you know about these, are very ambitious targets. Uh, the question is, how do you fund those targets? And clearly, foreign aid was not going to fund these. Uh, these there's a huge range of targets. Some of them are typical, let's say, economic development targets, but let me see. There's also, I wanted to distinguish that some, oh, I'm going to come to this. I want to talk about public goods as well. But financing these uh, SDGs, 
we see estimates like five to seven trillion dollars a year are needed to uh, achieve these SDGs. Now, many of, much of that money is already in place or will be contributed by development, developing countries themselves, but people talk about funding gaps of two and a half trillion dollars per annum. These, this is huge. Uh, so, the question is, Aid, traditional bilateral aid, is not going to fill these gaps of two trillion dollars a year. Uh, and we have to think, and that's not even, and in addition to this, there's, there's climate change um, funding that's required. We have to think differently about the, about the approach for finance for development. Uh, the, I know, I'm going to skip ahead for a couple of slides and then we'll come back to it, sorry. Um, what we want to think about is a, an alternative funding model, if you like, uh, for paving flows for social welfare improvement is to think of this four quadrant diagram as foreign, funding from foreign sources and funding from domestic sources and where that money goes which because some of that money will go to the public sector and some money can go to the private sector and what i want to point out is that traditional foreign aid that i talked about bilateral oda is just one little corner of this. It's official funding from governments going to other governments, providing some financing for them. But there's often now, amongst foreign sources, private sector money, which goes to the private sector in the developing country. And here we have examples of FDI is part of this finance for development, it helps development, and other types of loans, but I think F most notable FDI remittances, which are workers' remittances, money sent back by migrants from a high-income country, migrants who go to high-income countries, and send back money to their home. Remittances, I'll show you some figures that are becoming very important. And there's even private aid foundations, places like the Gates Foundation now, the Dell Foundation, are bigger than most government. Their aid programs are larger than uh, government programs. And then we have domestic sources of finance for development. Notably, the budget, which does a lot of work, but then the private sector in home countries which is the NGO sector, is also raising money domestically and doing a lot of work really in social welfare on behalf of the government. So the thinking, the new thinking is, we call this finance for development, is that aid is just one corner of the uh, one source of funding, and these other areas have to become expanded and be viewed by the government as alternative or as new sources of funding for, for uh, economic development. Now, let me go back. Yeah. Okay. I also wanted to make a, a distinction amongst these uh, sustainable development goals between what might be called uh, global public goods and private development goods. If you're just trying to develop your economic infrastructure, if you're developing your country in terms of its GDP, we might think of this basically as a private development good. The development benefits um, accumulate to the to the country, to the, to the low-income country. But now we've got a lot of these SDGs which are about climate change, clean air, clean water, which not 
I not directly, I not only benefit the uh, low income country, but they benefit the global country as well. In fact, they're very important to the rest of the world. There's a debate going on now, I believe in Brazil, about how much to develop the Amazon, and many countries and high, many high income countries are concerned that this is going to hurt climate change. So who's going to pay for this? And part of my argument here is that goals which are contribute to what we might call global public goods, like climate change, reducing CO2 emissions, keeping clean air. Uh, these are areas where it's more important for high-income countries to ante up and pay the cost or pro provide the financing in low-income countries. Because low-income countries have to be more concerned about their private development goals, about improving their quality of life, about improving their uh, income. Okay. Now, I mentioned to you this four quadrant diagram about sources. And if I can, this is the overseas development aid. Now, if we went further back, but if we go back, this is the 1990s. OBA is the largest of all the foreign flows. It looks pretty small down here, but it's still the largest. Fast forward to 2015, and we see that OBA is now the smallest of these balance of payments flows or, or potential developmental flows, where FBI is very high, remittances are, are, are extremely high, and then we have this other uh, other private uh, debt, well, other private debt and portfolio equity. It could be investment in both in government bonds uh, or it could be investment in uh, stock markets. It's clearly very volatile portfolio flows and not very reliable. But what's notable about remittances are that they have been much smoother and have been a reliable source for money coming back into home countries by migrants who who migrate who migrate abroad and send money and send money back. So we might even call remittances private foreign aid. And it's becoming recognized now that these how just how important uh, remittances are as a uh, as a source of uh, funding. This is to give you an idea about the uh, rise in the number of migrants. Uh, in the past, this is what, 20, uh, 25 years, it's been, it's been huge, and they're sending back uh, a lot of money back to their home countries. Um, that migrants are living abroad, Let's see what else I have. Okay, remittances sent to middle income countries. And, you know, there's a big debate about who migrates or who the migrants are. Well, they're often not the poorest people. In fact, a lot of migrants are actually skilled people, and because they have a better opportunity of getting jobs abroad. Many times migrants are sponsored by families who save up money to send somebody abroad who is going to send money back, uh, back home. So they're the investment. Uh, and remittances as a share of GDP, although a lot of migrants send money back to low income, uh, into middle income countries, Percentage-wise, their impact on low-income countries is, in fact, the, the highest. So an average a share of 8% of GDP uh, for these remittances. Now, I want to, uh, I want to give us a chance to talk about some things. Here's some uh, examples of remittance flows 
to a number of African countries. Uh, where you can see it can be in the double digit figures in some countries, but remittances being this share of GDP, remember that ODA was 3% of GDP for Africa as a whole, and uh, in South Africa, which is an upper middle income country, the uh, ODA is 0.3% of GDP. It's relatively small, but South Africa has a big GDP, so it's not a, it's still significant for South Africa. Um, there's a discussion about what motivates remittances, whether it's altruism or self-interest, and uh, we can discuss that. Um, the model that has become more popular, I sort of mentioned, is that migration is seen in, in traditional economics, migrants do things for their own benefit because any, you know, we're all individuals, selfish and greedy, so a migrant goes abroad for his own benefit. In this newer thinking of this co-insurance agreement, the migrant is sent abroad by his family as an investment to send money back home. I'm sure people can recognize that. The family saves up to send them to either to be schooled there or to pay their fares, and in return, they're obliged to send money back to the home. So it's sometimes called, called this co-insurance type of agreement or contractual uh, agreement. It's, um, and there's debates about what causes, what motivates remittances, whether it's the conditions in the home country or the conditions in the uh, partner country where migrants are working. Uh, I'm, I'll just briefly want to mention a paper I did with one of my students where we tried to look on a macroeconomic basis. We had a small model for poverty in Africa. We, this was. Uh, 32 countries. So we have a basic uh, underlying model of poverty as a function of income and Gini coefficient and in distribution. And we tested the effect of remittances, exports, foreign aid. There's a couple of dummy variables in here. Uh, the results, well, I don't want to go into the technicalities. The results. And we just we used several different methods of OLS and generalized least squares, two states least squares, but they all reported the same results. The basic model was poverty is uh, was related was could be explained by GDP per capita and the GDP coefficient were consistently significant. And then when we looked at these other ones, we found remittances were significant. Exports were not significant. ODA was not significant. These are some dummy variables. So it told us something that, um, in terms of relative importance, these remittances were actually an important element. And you can look from the coefficients that, to get an idea, 10% of the share of remittances. In GDP leads to a 1% decline in poverty. Okay, these were some rules of thumb which, uh, which, which come out of the idea of what the elasticity is of remittances to poverty. Well, look, I think I want to wrap up. Uh, oh, here, I have a couple of summary slides. So, one message is about traditional donors have become more realistic in rationing their aid. We saw they're treating low-income countries different from upper-middle-income countries. There continues to be a debate about the pros and cons of aid. Um, OBA aid itself is, the nature of that aid is changing with new instruments and this blending and leveraging we mentioned. Uh, there's an effort shifting away from just looking at aid for development to domestic resource mobilization and other types of uh, other types of foreign resources. 
I mentioned that we've got new development partners in this South-South cooperation, and this is an important growing area, particularly for BRICS. Uh, and their model is a little bit of a different model uh, based on the idea of mutual benefit. We talked about finance for development. And, okay, I can leave it there. I invite your questions to me, but I'm alternatively uh, and posing some questions to you. Is development assistance for a fundamentally a good or a bad thing for developing countries? Um, let's look at here. What is the uh, role for government in terms of these? Now in our world today, we see private flows being much larger than government flows. And what's the role for government in this sort of world where the government flows are not as significant as they used to be? Like we said, 30, 40 years ago, ODA was much bigger than any of the private flows. And finally, should we expect middle-income countries, uh, in particularly upper-middle-income countries, to give, to start to be becoming development partners or providing forms of aid? when they still have problems of their own. So let me leave it at that. Thank you. Okay.